Uh, so thank you for the, in the invitation and for the introductions. Today what I want to talk about is um, biodiversity. And biodiversity is a term I I'm sure all of you have heard many times. Um, so what I want to do is to start off talking a little bit about what is biodiversity. Um, because biodiversity means different things to different people. So I'll make sure that we're clear with what we mean by biodiversity. And then I want to go through a number of steps. One of the things I want to talk about today is what are the kinds of challenges in trying to research the importance of biodiversity? And one of the reasons, one of the very practical reasons for addressing that question is that governments spend millions and, and probably billions of euros each year to protect endangered species, to protect ecosystems. And people regularly ask us, why is that so important that we need to spend this much money? And so it's important to be able to demonstrate that biodiversity matters, and, and hence the title of my talk. Um, so I'll describe the kinds of values, I'll describe the kinds of challenges with actually demonstrating the value of biodiversity. Um, and then I'll talk about some small to medium scale experiments that people have done, including my group, uh, to try to demonstrate that. So biodiversity. You've all heard this term, because it's, it's in the press, people talk about it in the media all the time. Um, but biodiversity means more than just how many species there are. Um, we could very easily say biodiversity means that there are million, uh, two million species on the planet. But biodiversity means much, much more than that. Um, it includes a number of, of components, and we might divide up um, biodiversity into its structural compositional elements. So we might just describe biodiversity in terms of how many species there are, um, what the proportion of those species are, which are the most common, um, things like that. We might also describe biodiversity in terms of function, um, the kinds of processes that go on, the interactions between species, what they do in terms of producing uh, goods and services. So they produce fruits and, uh, and vegetables and things like that. So there are things they produce, and those are functions. Um, but as well as that, biodiversity occurs at different spatial and temporal scales. And from the center here, this, the writing's maybe a bit small, a lot to cram into one slide, but we go from genetic structure, so within a single population of a single species, we have a diversity of genetics. And so that's one form of biological diversity, the variation in genetics between individuals in a population. We might also have a number of populations from one place to another place. We know that even when we look at humans, people who come from one part of the planet look slightly different from another. So there are populations that are different as well. And so that's another kind of diversity. We might also have differences in the kinds of processes. So the diversity in terms of whether species, um, for instance, plants, whether they use nitrates or nitrites uh, or whether they use ammonium, those are different kinds of functions. Um, and participate in nutrient cycling. Okay, so biodiversity includes all of these things. So a number of different spatial scales, a number of different functions, and, um, and so it's, it's much more than just a number of species. Now this is a, a cartoon, but one of the things I want to emphasize here is that biodiversity is not just how many birds and how many mammals there are. It includes a lot of other species and includes things all the way from bacteria and viruses and prions on up to uh, really large multicellular organisms. This particular picture demonstrates diversity in terms of numbers of species um, by the size of the, of the organism. And what this shows is that in terms of numbers of species, insects make up by far the largest number of species on the planet, uh, and perhaps even the most biomass, although I think People who work in bacteria might tell you that bacteria make up the largest biomass on the planet. Um, but just to, to point out, here, here are mammals represented by a, a primate. Here are birds. And you can see that the numbers of those kinds of species is really quite small relative to other things like plants, uh, even uh, fungi, mushrooms. This is another picture, another artist, same idea, just to reemphasize that. Again, they've chosen different Organisms, but insects make up the largest number of species. Things like um, crustaceans, which in will include the spiders, um, the crabs, and things like that, make up a large portion of the diversity as well. 
So this is just to emphasize that when I, we say biodiversity, we're not stopping at just the very obvious species that you see in the planet. And so when people talk about conservation and protecting biodiversity, they're talking about a lot more than just those species. Well, one of the ways that we can describe biodiversity is what biologists refer to as food webs. And a food web might look like this. Um, now these kinds of pictures make me dizzy. Um, there's a lot of information here. So each one of these balls would represent a species. And a around the bottom here, these would be probably species that are green plants producing, uh, using uh, sunlight um, as their source of energy and then making uh, food available to other species um, higher up in the food web that eat them and then they go on into predators, etc. Now the problem with this is that even with this, which has an enormous number of connections, um, these are just connections where something gets eaten. It doesn't include interactions where species might be competing. So for instance, down here, these species are potentially um, competing for nutrients if they're plants. Uh, they might be competing for sunlight, for water. Um, and that kind of interaction isn't even shown here. And there are many other kinds of interactions that aren't shown here. So for those with a, a mathematical bent, you realize that to describe this system, each one of these interactions would be described by a very complex function by itself. Um, and those functions are not linear, and they're not even uh, one or two variables. They're usually fairly complex dynamics. <clears throat> and if you have a system like this and you're trying to describe it dynamically, uh, you know that it's just not a tractable system. Just another example, the same sort of thing. But this is one way that scientists have described it, and it's not very helpful, but it has contributed a very large amount to the development of theory over the years. And people have, have looked at this and tried to look at patterns in how these things are arranged. How many connections are there between species? Um, how strong are those connections? Um, and so people have been able to take that kind of system and develop some theory from that that suggests that the more species there are, the more stable a system is. Now I'm not going to go into the uh, details of that, but a lot of that's been done with um, fairly simple perturbations of an equilibrial model from, from, from its equilibrium point, assuming that close to equilibrium dynamics can be described by straight lines. And so I, I'm not going to say too much more about that for now. But the problem here is that um, that doesn't really help us demonstrate what each one of those little balls contributes to the stability or even the integrity of, of an ecosystem. Um, so that's really the question. And so what I want to do today is to go past that and show why each one of those little balls in that food web diagram, why does that matter? Uh, and what would happen if they disappeared? So let me give you one example here to just start thinking about this. So here's a food web um, for the Antarctic. And in the Antarctic Ocean, very many of the large species there <coughs> depend on krill, a small crustacean, a small shrimp-like animal, very, very abundant. Um, so one could ask, what would happen if one of these species disappeared? So the blue whale, for example, um, it's being hunted to nearly extinction. So if the blue whale didn't exist at all, would we really be able to measure uh, increases in all of these other species as a result? And the answer is probably not. Um, it's very difficult to measure small changes in ecosystems, especially when there are so many different connections like this. So you imagine, even if you removed blue whales here, the amount of change in other, those other species would probably be fairly imperceptible. Okay, so that's part of the challenge. Let me give you another example here. Um, the dodo bird, uh, one that I suspect many people have at least heard about, um, was a very common species isolated to the island of Mauritius, um, discovered by European sailors as they started to traverse the, the big uh, oceans and seas of the planet. And in the early 1500s, they came across the dodo, lived in an island where there were no predators, and so it, it didn't have to fly. It was very easy to catch, big. Um, I guess if it's cooked with the right kinds of spices, probably tasty. Um, but it was a source of fresh meat, and so the sailors, as they would go past, would, would catch these. And within less than 180 years, the dodo was extinct. Um, okay, so here's one big species that's now disappeared from an island. And the challenge is, 
has that affected the ecosystem it lives in? And part of the problem here um, can be demonstrated by this tree, the um, tabalacock tree, which has big seeds that were eaten by dodo birds. And for a very long period of time, um, there was a popular um, idea that this tree had gone, started to become extinct because the dodo bird wasn't there any longer. The dodo bird would, would eat the seeds, the seeds would go through the gut, um, they'd get slightly um, broken apart by the, uh, by the digestive tract of the bird, and then they would germinate. And so the argument was that the species of tree was disappearing through time because the dodo bird was no longer there. Well, part of the problem is that there are still some of these, these trees and they are still uh, germinating and so there are still some trees there. But the other problem is that there are lots of other changes that have happened in Mauritius during that same time period. Uh, during that time, the, a large portion of the area has been cleared um, for agriculture. Um, there's been introduction of herbivores, including things like deer and, and horses, um, cattle, um, which eat the seeds as well. And there's also an introduced fungus which affects the tree. So the problem with this as an example is that even though we've removed a single species, um, we can't really isolate changes to the rest of the ecosystem to the loss of that species. And this is one of the big problems that biologists face, is that we can't isolate the loss of single species um, and relate that to changes in the ecosystem because there's usually so many other changes in the planet. Let me just give you one more uh, example as a thought experiment here. Um, and I'm going to use the panda bear because it's a well-known, well-loved um, icon that the World Wildlife Federation uses, many other people use. Um, there are about 1,600 of these left in the wild in China. They live in high elevation forests. If all of those panda bears disappeared, would the bamboo forests of China look different? And the answer is, it's hard to say because there are so many other people there clearing the forests, using the forest for firewood, uh, clearing it for agriculture, there's changes in the air quality. How would you describe changes in the ecosystem and say it was just because the panda bear wasn't there? So this is the problem we have. And so really it requires an experimental approach to looking at how does changes in biodiversity affect system functions. So I'll launch into a little bit more. Oops. So let's just imagine a fairly simple system here, four species. We have two predators, uh, each of which eat two prey species. So the two predators, the two prey. Um, and predator one can eat both prey, same with predator two. So this would be a fairly simple system, still a lot of connections. But the reality is that even this system probably has more connections than show up there. So for instance, I showed you in that food web diagram that we'd probably expect there to be some competition here. So if, if this predator can eat both prey, then it could reduce the prey um, here that might otherwise be eaten by predator two. So there's gonna be competition. The two prey species might compete as well. There might also be feedbacks in other ways. So one of the things that can happen is they reduce numbers of their prey species, but they might also change their prey species in other interesting ways. So the prey might change their behavior they, they now hide from the predators. Um, they perhaps go to um, different parts of the environment than they did before. Or even more interesting, they might put energy into things like uh, toxic chemicals. Plants can do this. They can produce toxins that make it difficult for the predator to eat them. They can produce spines and things like that. So the prey themselves can actually change. So the system is a dynamic adaptive system. So you can't describe the dynamics here simply by um, the interactions of the, of the species without doing the full experiments. So let me give you an example, oh, just to um, remind you, for any who, who have a mathematical background, that this is one of these n by uh, n kinds of problems, is that, in fact, it's more than n by n. Um, and most mathematicians just throw up their hands and say this is an intractable problem. And in terms of solving the system di dynamics mathematically, it really is. And so this is one of the reasons that it's important to have an empirical approach, an experimental approach, to looking at the value of species within systems. Okay, here's an example, um, just again to show you some of the, the complexities within these systems. Um, 
And one of the approaches that we've taken is to start removing species from systems one at a time to see what would happen. And this is a fairly simple experiment where we had young cutthroat trout, so young of the, uh, Y-O-Y means young of the year, so they're less than one year old. Um, and there are lots of, lots of these fish in these streams that we work on. Most of the examples I'll give you will be aquatic because that's most of what my own research is in. Um, in these streams, there are also a large number of, of stoneflies. These are uh, insects that are also predaceous. They feed on even smaller bugs. Um, and so the main interaction here, we assumed, would be competition, that they're feeding on a prey assemblage. Um, and because they're both feeding on the same kinds of prey, we thought there'd be competition. So we set up an experiment where we could actually remove all of the predatory stoneflies from some streams and not from others. And we had mark, marked cutthroat trout, and we could look at the growth of those trout to see what would happen. And of course, the prediction, if they're competing, is that you remove the stoneflies and the, and the trout should grow faster. So we did the experiment, and the prediction is completely falsified. In fact, the results are in the opposite direction. So remember I said, if you remove the stonefly, the fish would grow faster because there's more prey. In fact, if you remove the stoneflies, the fish lose weight. So this is very different from the prediction. And the reason for this is there's another kind of interaction here. What's happening is that the stoneflies live in the gravel in the bottom where all those other prey species live. The fish, of course, are up in the water. And as the stoneflies walk around trying to catch prey, some of those prey escape and jump up out of the, the gravel and get caught by the trout. So in fact, this interaction is much more complex than we thought. So instead of being one of, of mostly competition here, it turns out the predominant interaction is one of what we call facilitation. And this is a category of effects that we call indirect effects. Um, but in this case, the fact that the stonefly uh, is not always successful at catching the prey means there are more prey going to the trout and they grow better. So in this case, we showed that the presence of the stonefly was important, but important in a different way than we thought uh, initially. But it still demonstrates that, again, in this system, species do have these roles that contribute to um, other species within the system and ultimately to the stability. Now, this is even complicated, and I'm, I'm just going to leave this example in a, in a moment. But I just wanted to point out the fact that um, as the cutthroat trout get bigger, they can eat the stoneflies. So in that first experiment, the, the trout were so small they couldn't eat the stoneflies, so predation wasn't an issue. But bigger ones can eat the stoneflies, and so predation then also becomes an, an issue. Um, with the, the ultimate feedback, then, that the numbers of these trout could increase over time. And so there's another feedback. So what I'm trying to tell you here is that some of these systems are very complicated. So even in this three species example, um, the dynamics are such that it's very difficult to isolate the roles of single species. And so this is one of the challenges that we run into frequently in trying to demonstrate how biodiversity contributes to ecosystem function. It's not meant to be an excuse, but it just means to, just to show you that there's a challenge here in trying to take the system and, f and show that individual species within that system are, are important. So when we talk about functions, um, there are a number of kinds of functions. And by function, we mean a number of things here. Um, first of all, they provide uh, ecosystem services. And th this is a term that's very common in the literature now, um, where species provide things like um, they clean the water. So some species collect particles from the water, they might even um, suck up nutrients. And so those are services that they provide, uh, provide clean water. They can provide clean air in some cases, nutrient recycling, uh, lots of plants, lots of bacteria, fungi involved in nutrient recycling. Uh, and if that wasn't the case, we would have all this dead plant matter just building up through time. But that those nutrients and that energy is recycled through the system because of these species. Um, it also contributes to ecosystem resilience and stability. So imagine that there is some sort of a, an event, a hurricane or a, a massive ice storm or um, a drought that comes through. Those systems are likely to persist better if there's more diversity, or at least that's what theory tells us. And so the stability of that system is thought to be enhanced by biodiversity. And then finally, um, 
I, I added intrinsic value because there are lots of people who will argue that, uh, from a philosophical point of view, that we don't need to worry about um, the services that biodiversity provides. We should be protecting biodiversity because it's our moral responsibility as humans. Um, and that's kind of a philosophical point of view and a belief, um, and one that's obviously valid, um, but it's not really one that's testable scientifically. Just as an example of ecosystem services, for instance, um, small streams without fish still produce lots of um, organic matter, lots of small bugs, which get carried out of these small streams. Um, so there's a small stream here. They get carried out into bigger streams where fish might be waiting for them. And that's a type of ecosystem service. Uh, another type of ecosystem service would be that a lot of the very fine particles of organic matter that get carried down streams get eaten and captured by, um, by invertebrates, small insects that live in the bottoms of these streams. And so those are examples of ecosystem services. Now, one of the debates in, in biology for a very long time has been this issue of, of diversity and stability. So uh, is a more complex system really more, um, more stable? And the original work on this came from, from theoretical work done as far back as the 60s, where very simple matrices of species by species interactions were set up. Um, the interactions were assumed to have an equilibrium um, for an n by n case, which is very difficult to come by. But once you found and were able to solve for that equilibrium, you could perturb individual species by small amounts around equilibrium and look, to look, look at the recovery dynamics. So one could then look to see how quickly do you return to equilibrium following a, a small perturbation around equilibrium. And from that, these more complex systems were shown to have better stability properties. It was harder to to perturb them from equilibrium, but they also return to equilibrium faster. And from that time forward, the dogma, at least in, in ecology texts, was that more species were better. Now, that's theoretical. And of course, people have debated that for the last 20 or 40 years, I guess. Um, and so not everybody agrees that that's the case. Um, one of the problems is that when you actually start to put in realistic um, functions that connect up these species, those nonlinearities between uh, species and some of the complex feedbacks make it very difficult to actually get equilibrium. And it also makes it very difficult to uh, achieve the kinds of results in a fairly simple system that was the original work uh, that was done in the 1960s. There's also a risk here that um, if you can't test this theory, if you can't do an experiment to test it, then it runs the risk of becoming circular, that um, you know, we, we say theory predicts this, and therefore it is. And if we can't test theory, then um, you're really in, a, in an awkward position. And it, it runs the risk of becoming just a belief. Um, so it really has to be put to the test. And so this is one of the things people have done over the last 20 to 25 years, is started to test some of these ideas. Okay, one of the predictions that this makes um, from the stability diversity debate is that the more species you have, the more efficient these systems will be. So as we increase the number of species along here, we expect that the productivity of those systems, their efficiency, their stability will be increased. And that losing species coming the other way will eventually lose those properties, those functions of the ecosystem. Now the shape of this curve is kind of interesting. And I'm going to just point out the shape of this decelerating curve because I'm going to show you some empirical data in a moment, um, which looks eerily like this, this shape of this curve. Um, and that's an important point. So one of the things to remember, and I've already emphasized the challenge of showing the value of, of individual species. One of the things here is if we're way out at the end here and we take out one species, will the change in those functions be out, um, big enough compared to our measurement errors that we can actually detect that. So that, that's part of the problem that we'll uh, explore in just a minute here. The other thing is it also depends on which species. So if you go into an ecosystem and if it's a, a species out here, um, it's, it's different than if it's one of the only a few species in it, down to this part. So the incremental change in those services might also depend on which species, not just that it's a species that's lost. OK, I just, I just put this in just to remind you that in any ecosystem, some species are very common. 
so they make up a very large number of the individuals or the biomass. Some species are quite rare. Um, and that's a fairly typical kind of uh, result. Just about any ecosystem you look at. Um, it also means that in terms of these services, the amount that each of these species contributes to the services will probably be more abundant um, or um, a larger contribution to the total services from species that are common than ones that are rare. But that's not always the case either. Okay, I need to <clears throat> introduce a couple hypotheses here. So theory says that more species, the system is more stable, more efficient. And scientists have given very cute names um, to some of these hypotheses. For one of the hypotheses is the so-called rivet hypothesis. And the analogy is that a system will be stable <clears throat> very much like a, an airplane wing. And you, you know rivets that hold wings metal together. So you can pull out rivets one at a time. And for a long time, the plane will still fly. Um, but you pull out one last rivet, and all of a sudden, the plane will fail catastrophically. The wing will just fall off. Um, and so that's the rivet hypothesis, that we can remove species one at a time, and the system will still go along OK until you take out that last species, and then it fails. Um, and when we say fail, um, things uh, become very vulnerable to um, invasion. They lose their efficiencies. They become unstable. They vary through time. Another hypothesis <clears throat> has been called the portfolio hypothesis. So the idea that biodiversity um, provides a very diverse uh, portfolio of stocks, like the stock market. So if you um, are worried about stocks going up and down a lot, you have a lot of diversity. And um, then you don't have to worry about them going up and down so much. Um, and the same idea applies to ecosystems, that if there are lots of species, if one goes up and down, they probably won't all go up and down, or at least there'll be some averaging over all those species. And so this is another hypothesis for how biodiversity contributes to stability. Another is the, the insurance hypothesis, <clears throat> which is really outside of those two. And it, what it suggests is that um, some of these species really don't contribute very much. But on the rare occasion that something happens to the system, so your ver most common species perhaps gets a disease and they all die, if there are other species that can compensate, then perhaps you have that kind of insurance in the ecosystem that allows that system to persist longer through evolutionary time. And maybe that's the system that we see today. And then finally, the other one is, is the so-called idiosyncratic, which means that everything does um, something, and, and we don't really have to have a general pattern. Um, so it's kind of a default hypothesis, um, almost a null hypothesis. <coughs> So I want to show you a number of, of experimental studies where people have tried to demonstrate the role of biodiversity. And the first one is a very, <coughs> excuse me, a very contrived example done in um, uh, laboratories and in um, climate chambers. And this work was largely done at um, university um, in, in England at Imperial College. And they called it the Ecotron. And they had a number of these climate chambers each one of these things is self-enclosed. So the, um, here's the CO2. So it's pretty much a self-contained unit. So um, this is very much like the um, Biosphere 2 they built in Arizona and in the United States, where everything was supposed to be self-contained. Um, so a closed system. <coughs> Excuse me. For biodiversity, they had three different levels of biodiversity. Um, and this first one here with nine species, representing predators, herbivores, plants, and of course decomposers to um, process the dead organic matter from those plants. Uh, medium biodiversity, and then in the last case, high biodiversity. So um, even at this, this is not a, a, a trivial matter to look at the interactions between these species. This is still a fairly large number of species, and, and I, th I think you could see with the number of connections here, this would be very difficult to model uh, mathematically. So the kinds of experiments they did were to put these systems into these, these climate chambers. Uh, they let them run for a number of years and looked at what do you get in terms of primary productivity, stability of, of things like CO2 flux, uh, a number of other parameters, just stability of the system as well. Do, do you actually end up with all these species at the end of, of the, the experiment? Um, or do some of them disappear? So these are just two examples of the kinds of data that they found. Um, 
so this is over the course of about half of a year. And what you see is that the low biodiversity case uh, ends up with lower productivity overall. So the, the only, uh, there are only a few plant species in that system, and they can't contribute enough primary productivity to fill up the, or take up the available energy uh, in the system compared to the high biodiversity case. In, in terms of carbon flux, carbon flux is lower um, and less variable in the um, case with high biodiversity. So these are just two examples showing that biodiversity in this case contributes to system function by enhancing primary productivity, uh, total primary productivity, and enhancing the stability of, of carbon flux. Okay, so that's, that's one example. Um, that work was done back in the 1990s, um, and it's pretty much finished now. Another example, and, and although I say this is medium scale, um, this is still a lot of work, this particular experiment. This is done in Cedar Creek, Minnesota, uh, by David Tillman and colleagues. And in this, they have these small plots of land in the, in the grasslands. Um, and you can see what they've done here is they've, they've plowed out, or sorry, um, uh, cut the lawn in between these, these plots. And in each of these plots, they've put different combinations of species, so different numbers of species and different combinations. So not just the, so you might have a, a four species plot, but not always the same four species. And so this experiment looks both at the which species and the numbers of species. Um, and you can see it's a fairly large experiment. Um, so, but it still doesn't compare to the whole prairie. So here we've lost some of the natural dynamics. We still don't have grassland fires going through. Um, things like that that would, would otherwise uh, affect larger areas. So this is still relatively small scale uh, in the big scheme of things. Just to show you a little bit of data from that, what they found was that the more species they had, the more primary productivity that they had. So um, the idea here is that there's what they call complementarity, that um, if there's any kind of gaps or any other way to get sunlight or nutrients or water, uh, one species will find that maybe better than another. And so you tend to end up with, with greater productivity uh, in terms of total biomass or primary productivity uh, with more species that you have. And so this had run for a number of years, and you can see that over time, of course, it, it continues. But even in the first year, uh, that pattern is obvious. So, so again, numbers of species contributes to ecosystem function in terms of primary production. Very similar experiment done here in Europe. Um, this involved uh, seven EU countries. Um, it's called BioDepth, and very similar kind of experiment. And, and so I won't really go into the results of that. Um, but you can see these different plots, different species uh, in each of these, looking at the same kinds of things. And the general results that they find is that the more species there are, um, the more certain functions you get. Um, or the other way of looking at it is if biodiversity has decreased, uh, productivity declines, the recycling of nutrients declines. Um, of course, if there's less primary production, there's less nutrients being taken up and there's more that get into the groundwater and leave the system, so it's less efficient in that way. Um, if there's less plant production, there'll be less dead plant material uh, available for invertebrates in the soil and other kinds of organisms in the soil like bacteria and fungi. And so again, they um, that function declines as well. Okay, I'll show you a few more examples here. Um, now these will be smaller subsets of, of these ecosystems. And the one that I'm gonna sp spend a few minutes on is looking at detritus comp uh, decomposition. Um, in most ecosystems, the breakdown of dead organic matter, whether it's dead salmon, whether it's dead uh, leaves from trees or, or other materials, is a very important process. So it's one of the reasons that we aren't uh, uh, knee deep or, or deeper in um, organic matter out, out there. It's because it gets processed by all these kinds of organisms. So there are lots of things that eat this material. And in streams in particular, um, leaves falling into the streams very quickly are degraded. So in the space of a few weeks, um, a leaf will fall in. It'll be colonized by a variety of species, notably um, fungi, mushrooms, uh, very small ones, of course, um, subsequently eaten by a number of invertebrates, uh, even fish. Um, and so it gets decomposed fairly quickly here in the space of eight weeks. Um, some species faster, some slower, but it's a major process and an important ecosystem function. 
there are a lot of species. And in, in most streams here in North America, other places, you could easily find in the neighborhood of 30 to 100 species of mushrooms that would live on, on leaves in, in these streams. Same is true for the invertebrates, is that there might be anywhere from, from 10 in some streams to 100 in other streams. So many species that are involved in this decomposition. As one goes to the tropics, you find more and more species like fish even that feed on decaying leaves and streams. So it's an important function. Um, just as, a, a, as an aside, just uh, mostly as a curiosity, there's an experiment that was done in North Carolina uh, in the United States where the importance of this um, leaf litter falling into streams was, was tested by taking a whole stream, about a, 200 meters worth of a stream, and putting a net over top of it to exclude leaf litter. Um, and this experiment's been running now for about 12 years. Um, very fascinating study, and if you're interested, the reference is here at Bruce Wallace. But um, just to demonstrate the importance of, of leaf litter as a, as a function in these ecosystems. OK, so some of the first work that was done looking at this um, used very simple systems with two or three, uh, one, two or three species of, um, of invertebrates feeding on leaf litter. And this is work um, by uh, Michael Johansson and uh, Bjorn Momkist. And as one goes through more and more species, so controlling for biomass, so you might have um, three of one species, uh, and in the three species case, you'd have one individual of three species. So you try to control for numbers and for biomass. Um, doing that, we look at the rates of decomposition, and you can see that as you have more species, the rates of decomposition go up. So this suggests biodiversity matters in terms of the rate of, of this function, decomposition of organic matter in streams. However, when we go further out, so they, a couple years later, decided to add more species, and so this is represented largely here. So over the first few species, you can see that biodiversity does matter in terms of ecosystem function. But as you get further out, you remember I showed you that decelerating curve earlier on. So the further out we get here, the less incremental addition to function that we see by adding species. OK, I'll come back to that point again later. We also see contributions to uh, some of these processes when we look at things like um, mixtures of leaves. So we might go to a stream that drains through a, a forest with only one tree species, and so we only have one kind of organic matter. Um, but we might also have a, a stream that goes through a very diverse forest and has many kinds of organic matter. And one of the things that we find is that if we compare um, the mixture, so in this case this is alder and cedar leaves, um, this one would be alder and hemlock, um, cedar and hemlock being um, conifers, um, this is from British Columbia. And if we look at deviations from the predicted values, so we make some predictions about what the individual leaves would, would expect. We do the additive model. This shows that for some combinations, there is a very large difference in the biomass supported um, on those leaves by having mixtures relative to the individual cases. So again, this suggests that diversity has a very positive role in contributing to ecosystem function in this case. OK, and the last example with the decomposition is one that was done close to Toulouse here. Um, Antoine um, uh, Le Serif is now in my lab in Vancouver, so we kind of switched places, I, it seems. He, he moved there just in August to join me as a postdoctoral fellow. Um, but this work is, is using um, the same kind of leaves, but mixture of forests. And so this was done in um, using alder leaves or oak leaves in these small kinds of bags. Um, so these bags have fairly large mesh. Invertebrates can get in and out. Um, but it was done in mixed forest and beach forest. So again, the idea here is that in the beach forest, because there's only being a source of one type of leaf, there might be fewer kinds of species available in the streams to colonize the leaf litter. And what they found was that in these mixed forest streams, uh, whether it's oak or whether it's alder, the decomposition, decomposition rates were higher in mixed tree forests than in single tree forests. Um, this was done in fine mesh bags, so in this case the invertebrates can't get in, and it's usually only the fungi and bacteria that contribute. And even so, you can still see this effect of the decomposition rate being higher in a mixed tree forest than in a single tree forest. So again, another contribution of, of diversity to an ecosystem function.
Well, none of these really get at the actual mechanism. Um, what is the actual function uh, mechanism that allows multiple species to contribute to ecosystem function more than single species? Um, and this is work that's been done looking at another group of invertebrates and streams. And these are species that sit on the stream bottom and catch little particles of organic matter going by. Um, some of you might know black flies, they're biting flies. Um, I forget what the French name is, but um, these are black fly larvae. Um, these are some other, uh, there's another group called caddis flies. But there are a, a fairly large diversity of species that, that provide this kind of role. Um, just some close ups of some of these species. As I say, they have these, in this case, these uh, black flies have antennae that they modify for catching particles, and um, that's how they feed. This species just puts out its arms and catches particles as it goes by. Um, some other species actually build um, webs. And the caddis flies in particular produce silk, very much like spiders, and are actually able to trap uh, particles by building a web. And so here's the, the net. It's, as I say, uh, woven out of silk. Flow's coming this way, traps particles. The larva, which looks something like this, lives in this, this area here where it's protected itself with little bits of wood and stone. Um, and in most streams where these species are found, there are usually anywhere up to about a dozen species. Um, so this experiment was done to look at what would happen if you had mixtures of these species versus single um, assemblages. So you could have 30 of one species, or you could have 10 of one species, 10 of another, 10 of the third species. And what was found is that if one looks at the expected resource consumption, so the rate at which uh, these particles are removed from water, um, this is what one would predict, oh, this is what one finds on average when this, you have the single species case. Uh, so that's then the expected value, but we find that the observed value is nearly double. So having a mixture of species contributes more to the rate of this ecosystem function than having just a single species. And you can see that some species part, uh, benefit from this more than others. So in this case, this third species here benefits more by being in a mixture uh, than perhaps this other species down here. So there's not much difference in the single versus mixed species case. The mechanism here, um, skip that, the mechanism here turns out to be a hydrodynamic feature if you only have one species, all the nets are kind of the same height. And so water passing over the, the nets um, is, is largely depleted of, of food. And so these animals um, aren't getting as many particles because um, the flow is, is already being intercepted by an individual upstream that's got a net of the same height, same dimensions. By having other species in here, you start to get some uh, differences in the heights. And so you start to get some turbulence created amongst the nets and also some, some uh, free flow areas that allow these particles to be intercepted by nets downstream. And if one looks at the near bed velocity behind these nets, uh, what one finds is that the velocity is higher behind individual nets, um, so it hasn't been slowed down by nets of the same height uh, if you have mixed species. And again, as one moves from the net here to 16 to 18 centimeters downstream, you can see the mixed species case slows less than when you have a single species. And it's largely because in a single species case, they're all at the same height, intercepting the same things, and you don't have the diversity effect. So here's one example, at least, where people have been able to demonstrate a mechanism involved. Another way we've, we've tried to look at the same problem of, of contribution of individual species is um, one where we've taken moderate or medium scale kinds of experimental setups and remove single species at a time. Now I showed you that one experiment earlier on where we removed uh, stoneflies and looked to see what would happen to the, those trout. And we've actually now done that with a number of other species to try to figure out how do individual species contribute. Um, and the corollary of that is can other species compensate? So if you remove a species that's doing one thing, a species that perhaps is, perhaps is um, uh, feeding on leaf litter, would some of those other species just make up for it by colonizing those areas? There's extra resources. Um, so, so we might expect some degree of compensation. Now that turns out not to happen as often as we might think. Um, so most of these are relatively small scale. This is a set of experimental stream channels that we use for a lot of, of our research. Um, very artificial in many respects, but it allows us to at least do these kinds of experiments that we couldn't otherwise do in natural systems.
And this is where we can do uh, experimental eliminations. So one, one ex set of experiments we've done just in the very recent past is looking at the effects of crayfish in these systems by putting um, crayfish into these enclosures within the stream. We have other enclosures without crayfish. And so we can look to see what happens if we, re we remove crayfish from some areas of stream bottom and we still get the same functions. One of the things that we see uh, very commonly in terms of detritus breakdown is that if we have crayfish, um, if we remove crayfish, so these two cases without crayfish, the rate at which leaf litter is broken down is much, much slower. So the, what, what this is showing you here is how much is left at the end of the experiment. So it's breaking down much faster, more of it's being consumed when the crayfish are present. So there's a fairly big difference here um, and it's, there's no compensation in this system. So uh, even though there are lots and lots of other invertebrates, in fact, there are over 30 species that also feed on decaying leaves in this, this stream system, and yet they can't compensate, even over the course of about a month, for the uh, extra availability of resources and the lack of the crayfish. So, so in this case, removing single species shows us that single species can play large roles in these systems. Um, and, and as I mentioned, even though the, um, these other species could compensate, and they do increase in numbers. So without the crayfish, you can see the numbers of these invertebrates, uh, shown here on the left, the numbers of these invertebrates do increase. But they can't increase sufficiently in terms of their contribution to that function to compensate for the lack of the crayfish. Okay, another example is uh, with tailed frog. This is a, a species that's uh, whose tadpole lives in streams, feeding on algae on the surface of rocks, found in the west coast of North America. Um, it's a species that's actually considered uh, threatened uh, because it's a very limited distribution. Um, the tadpoles, as I said, feed on the algae on the top surfaces of stones. And we've done experiments where we've put small enclosures, again, very artificial system. But these are plastic pipes cut in half, screening around them to keep all the uh, the tadpoles in. And then we look to see whether or not removing tadpoles would affect the, um, the rate at which um, algae is produced. Um, so these things are eating the algae. If there's extra algae, one would expect compensation by other invertebrates that would also eat algae. What we found, oops, skip that. What we found was, um, and we'll just look at this end of the, the curve here. So without tadpoles, um, we get a fair amount of algae. Just adding one or two tadpoles you can see that there's quite a bit of, of depletion of algae. But even over the space of six weeks in this case, those other invertebrates in the system can't compensate for the absence of, of the tailed frog. So again, we get accumulations of algae. We didn't look at the algae itself. I'm sure that the types of algae were probably very different as well. But another example where removing a single species isn't, isn't compensated for by other species in the system. So at least in this case, we know that individual species are important to system function. And by corollary, we then say that at least some aspect of biodiversity uh, is important to these systems. And losing it has, um, has big consequences. OK, I'm just going to remind you of the shape of this curve. Um, so this is that decelerating function I was saying before that theory predicts. And I suggested that it's very difficult to really detect the incremental change of losses of species when you're way out at the end of this curve. Um, this is very similar to that rivet hypothesis that I mentioned earlier, that we could lose species one at a time for a very long time before we really saw anything change. And until we got to where it starts to get a little uh, accelerated um, or st steepen off towards the end there, then we might see some real measurable changes. Um, and of course, once we get to that stage, it's probably too late because it's hard to recover the system. Um, so one of the other ways of looking at the results from this whole series of experiments that people have done. So we've done experiments where we've d had number, different numbers of species. Other people have, have done those. You saw those grassland examples. Um, Brad Cardinelli has done a, a meta-analysis recently um, where he looked at these kinds of patterns. And this is from a whole series of different kinds of experiments, um, including uh, aquatic systems in black, uh, gray, um, gray lines for terrestrial systems. And I just took this right out of his uh, paper um, in nature so that it's, it's not a very good graphic. But I think you can see the shape of those curves tend to show that same sort of pattern that as we add species, the incremental contribution of those species diminishes. So what he found 
going through this was that um, one of the things that is important to note is that there is a positive relationship. So that in almost every case, adding species has a positive effect on ecosystem function. So biodiversity does matter. But the fact that that curve decelerates means that it's, it's um, more difficult to show um, the incremental contribution of, of additional species. So we get to a point where it's really outside of the measurement error, uh, or within the measurement error, rather. Um, and so it's very difficult to demonstrate that that's actually contributing. On average, in this meta-analysis, he found that complex mixtures of species did no better on average than the, the best single species. So you remember that curve accelerates very quickly and then decelerates. In that very steep part of the curve, that species, or whichever species are contributing to that, um, on average contribute a very large proportion of ecosystem function. And then adding more species changes it very little. The problem, though, is predicting which species that might be. And so the challenge then becomes, if you're going to set priorities for conservation, which ones do you conserve? And so a very prudent uh, manager would say that, well, we're not going to take that risk, and so we want to preserve the entire system. Okay, just a couple of things to note in terms of looking at these kinds of experiments, one of which is that in the last decade, we've started to realize that these ecosystems are not nearly as well bounded as we used to think. Um, if we had a system that was well bounded, it would be a little easier to demonstrate some of these functions and the contributions. We now know that um, there are fluxes of materials across ecosystem boundaries that have a very large effect. And this is from an experiment we did um, looking at uh, species that live in stream sides. So in this case, we were looking at spiders that are feeding on um, insects. But one of the sources of insects for these spiders are the adult stages of aquatic insects that come up out of the stream and get uh, into the riparian area. So they're not feeding just on terrestrial insects now. Um, and in this case, we had um, these greenhouses that we built over streams. We built four of these things to stop the aquatic insects from getting to these riparian spiders. And this graph just shows that we were able to deplete the number of insects to about half by putting up these enclosures. Um, and this is replicated four times within a stream and on two streams. And um, what we found was that if we looked at the numbers of spiders, uh, we found that for most of the spiders here, um, the numbers of, of the individuals were much higher when they had access to that resource coming from the stream than when they didn't. So this leakiness of ecosystem boundaries will also make it more difficult to show the contribution to function of biodiversity within a system because there are additional connections outside of the ecosystem. So that's starting to show us that there's some more interesting dynamics here uh, than just within the system. The other thing that's complicating, and I gave you one example where I talked about the different sizes of cutthroat trout having access to different kinds of prey. Um, it turns out that some species, as they get larger and larger, do different things. Uh, and for example, young of the year crayfish feed on different kinds of things and they have different interactions with other species in the system than do larger crayfish. Um, so adult crayfish have um, a relatively minor effect on young of the year fish, which are often down in the gravels. Um, but these small crayfish are actually very aggressive. They're very nasty to these young fish. And they actually eat them, eat the young fish. So there's some very negative interactions, whereas the big crayfish just don't even bother with it. So what we then talk about are ecological species. So it may be that not only the number of species, but the sort of ecological classes within those species plus the numbers of species make a difference. So again, just to, by way of showing that the, the diversity and the complexity here makes it very difficult to demonstrate some of these ecosystem functions and the contribution of species to that. And the real challenge with all of this is how does this scale up to realistic ecosystems? You can't do these kinds of experiments uh, in natural ecosystems, usually. Uh, it's impossible to go to a large river or an estuary or, or a tropical rainforest and do these kinds of experiments where you haven't also confounded it by some other changes. Uh, there are a very few limited examples where these kinds of things have been done successfully. Um, the results of all of those suggest that losing species does change ecosystem function uh, in some ways. But it's difficult to do for most systems. And that's going to remain a challenge. Okay, So just to summarize then, the, the challenges include the fact that the identity of the species does matter. 
So it's not just the numbers of species. And so when we show these curves, the numbers of species versus function, um, that's not the only thing that matters. It also matters that there are certain kinds, uh, certain species involved. Um, the scaling from very small experiments to larger experiments is, is challenging. But one of the other things to keep in mind is that when we do these small scale experiments, usually we're looking at a single function. Uh, and in a natural system, of course, there are lots of different kinds of ecosystem functions to which different species contribute unequally. Um, and so even though we might be looking at a single function and seeing deceleration on the, a single function, it might be that some of those species towards the end of that curve are contributing to other parts of, of the system's dynamics. So it's very difficult to do an experiment where you look at all ecosystem functions at the same time. Uh, but that's important because otherwise we get into this kind of circular argument again. Um, the last two things was, uh, were just to point out these non-bounded systems, that these subsidies between ecosystems turn out now to be very, very important. And um, there's been a, an enormous amount of literature written on that in the last decade. Um, OK, so finally at the end, um, and ready for questions. So just by way of a few conclusions then, um, the evidence strongly suggests that biodiversity does contribute to uh, ecosystem function in terms of its stability, its resilience, and productivity, and other ecosystem services. Most of these results come from relatively small scale experiments though, and the scaling is still a big issue. Um, the consequences of the loss of biodiversity are really difficult to demonstrate um, largely because natural systems where we're seeing be species become endangered or even disappear are also confounded with a lot of other kinds of changes, not just the loss of those individual species. We can't really do the experiment where we go and re remove pandas experimentally and look to see what happens. Nobody would let you do that experiment. So, um, so we have difficulties in being able to demonstrate the importance. And then finally, there are a lot of important reasons that we still need to pursue testing of the roles of biodiversity. Uh, both for humanity's sake, but also for the sake of those species themselves and protecting natural ecosystems. Okay, and at that, I'll, I'll leave it to questions.